Champions, I trust that you're enjoying September so far. We're one week in, and I trust that, you know, you're enjoying the new weather, the new month. I know with September, there are a lot of us that are facing different seasons, entering new seasons, maybe facing different challenges in a season of transition. I know there's a lot of us here who might be facing a new job. Uh, maybe a new experience, a new circumstance in their family, maybe a new school if you're a student here today. I know that there's a lot of he- ahead and, and there's a new season that we're really heading into. And if you're like me, new seasons can sometimes be a little bit overwhelming because you're facing the new season, but you feel like you have the same old strength. You know what I'm talking about? Where there's a lot that you know that is ahead. There's, you know there's a lot of challenges ahead, you know there's a lot of things that you have to do, but it feels like there's no new strength. And if you're like me, what happens is anxiety starts to creep in. You're thinking about this new season, you have the same strength, and you start to wonder, how in the world will I be able to do it all? And you want to follow God, right? You, you want to do his word. You want to step into the dreams that he has for you. You might hear a preaching or you might have read the word of God and you want to step in. You want this to be the season where you sign up for a ministry, where you follow God wholeheartedly, where you accomplish all that he has tasked you to do. And you tell yourself this season will be different, but then your mind starts to ask those questions. How can I do all of that new stuff when I have no new strength? When I'm at the end of my rope, how how can I step into the purpose God has tasked me to do in all those things when I feel like I can't even do what I need to do today? Anybody resonate with that? Is it just me? See, these questions and these doubts, if they're not left handled, they end up paralyzing us. And it it, it leads us in this place where we end up not doing anything for God. We end up stuck in the same uh, mindset, in the same place, and we don't ever leave our comfort zone. We don't ever follow God into all that he has for us. If that's you today, I'm here to encourage you as you enter into this next season. See, I'm here to remind you, yes, you do have real limitations, But for everything that God has called you to do, for every dream that he has placed in your heart, he will give you the power to complete it. He will give you the ability to accomplish it. See, don't get discouraged if your strength is limited, but be encouraged that your God will give you more than enough of what you need. So we need to enter this new season knowing that God has power for his church. Power to live out the impossible. Power to impact our world. Power to live as citizens of heaven here on earth. Power that comes from only the Holy Spirit resting on us and filling us daily. And today, if you've joined us, you've come the right Sunday because we're starting a series called Power. And we're inviting the Holy Spirit over the next couple of weeks to empower us as a church as we enter into this new season. And I'm praying that, that, that you would come alongside us, that you would join us and be empowered as the people of God. You know, as I was praying about this new season and what's ahead, I started to ask myself the question, what would the church look like if we walked empowered by God? What would the church look like if we embraced the Holy Spirit's power on us? What would our city look like? What would our school look like? What would our community look like if we walked clothed with power from on high? What would the church be? We know what the church would look like because we see it biblically in the book of Acts. We see the the people of God, the church. Remember, the church is in a building. It's the people of God. We see the, the, the church empowered by the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. 
And throughout this series, I'll be pulling from specific passages to encourage us in how the power of God can impact our very lives. If you don't know the book of Acts, if you're new here and you've, you've just, you're new to Christianity, I'll tell you, the book of Acts comes after the Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then you get to the book of Acts. Scholars believe that this book was written by Luke. Luke uh, uh, wrote this book, and they believe that it's actually a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. Some believe it to be called Acts because it documents the Acts of the Apostles. Others better believe it to be the, the, the book of Acts because it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts is mentioned over 50 times. Luke here is, is carefully and skillfully documenting the first 30 years of the early church. And unlike other history books, he's not giving every single detail of every single account, but he's carefully choosing which ones to include in order to edify the church. You see, there's a lot of different reasons why Luke wrote the book of Acts, and one of them is to bridge the gap between the Gospels and also for the letters of Paul, to trace the history of the church. But another purpose of the book of Acts is to see how the church grew, to see amongst persecution, the church still expanded, to also see how the church defended itself, that it continued on, that how, how it continued to, to, to stand up amongst all the persecution. And the book of Acts also helps guide us in faith and practice, practice. But let me tell you the main purpose of the book of Acts. See, more importantly, Luke writes Acts to emphasize the crucial role of the Holy Spirit and it's, it's, it's ability, his ability to empower the church to be effective witnesses. You see, the book of Acts, if you read it, and I encourage you, all of you to read it, it will show you how the real power of God impacted the lives of everyday people. And you literally see the kingdom of God going from just a few in Jerusalem to all of Judea and Samaria, all the way at the end of Acts to, the, to, to Rome. And then to where? It expands to the ends of the earth, to right here in Brampton, right? All the way here today. All of it happened, why? Because real power fell on the church. And all of a sudden, the limitations of man didn't matter. God was at work in his people. See, the whole book, you know, our series text is Acts 1.8. If you don't know it, it says you'll be my witnesses throughout Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria. It, the whole book can be outlined in that progression. And you literally see the kingdom of God going from just a few to many. How? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. I would encourage you, don't miss the next four weeks. Learn about the Holy Spirit. Maybe you haven't learned about the Holy Spirit. Come and, and listen to see what God says about the Holy Spirit. We're gonna be talking about his power. We're gonna be talking about how it transforms us, how it gives us boldness and strength and wisdom. We're gonna be talking about the gifts of the Spirit that he has given to his church. I wanna tell you, don't miss it. Could it be that what you're missing in your life and in your walk with God is the Holy Spirit? So come, walk with us for the next four weeks because there is real power for you and me and for all those who believe in Jesus. A power that's already come down, that's already here with the Holy Spirit. Power that is given freely as a gift. You see, the early church had to wait for this power to come down from heaven. But the good news for you and me is that the wait is over. The Holy Spirit is here. And he's ready for us to receive him. And that's what I want to speak about today and encourage you. For you to know that the wait is over. The Holy Spirit is here. So turn your Bibles to Acts 1. Acts 1, we're going to be reading the, the opening verses of Acts 1. Acts 1, we'll read 1 to 11. So this is what it says. I'm reading from the NIV version. It says, In my former book, Theopolis, 
I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he, was, he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse six. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Verse nine, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Whew, that's an amazing passage. God bless his word. You know, we're reading this passage today because before we can look at how the Holy Spirit empowers us, we need to look at why Jesus gives the Holy Spirit and his power. Why is it that we need the power of God? Why is it? And there's no better way to know why the Holy Spirit has come and why the Holy Spirit has given his power than to look at the words of Jesus. In our passage today, what do we see? We see the resurrected Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he's appearing to his disciples. Imagine the state of the disciples. You're seeing the risen Lord, okay? He has overcome death, hell, and the grave, and he's standing right there before you. Imagine the state of the disciples. Oh my goodness, this guy's not just a man, he's God. He is really who he says he is. The God of the universe was right there before them. And I can imagine in these last moments them feasting on every word he spoke. He said, as his time was ending, he always prophesied to them that he would go back to the Father. And in these moments, he's telling the church important instructions. He's convincing him that he is God, but also he's mobilizing them, empowering them, telling them of what's next. And he gives them this command, and Luke records it, Acts 1, 4 to 5. He says this, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Look what he says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You see, before Jesus goes and he leaves earth and ascends to heaven, he tells his people, wait for the Holy Spirit. He commands them. He says, do not leave Jerusalem without him. You see, it wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't an opinion, but it was charged from the authority of God, a command, wait for the Spirit. You better wait for the Spirit. Why? See, Jesus knew they needed the Holy Spirit for what was next. You see, they, they needed to know that, and we need to know that today, that we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And he made it very clear to the disciples what he was calling them to do required them to have the power of the Holy Spirit. So he tells them, wait. Anybody here like waiting? I don't know. I find it so interesting he tells them to wait. You know, the Father could do whatever he wants. In that moment, he could have given the Holy Spirit. As Jesus ascended, he could have given the Holy Spirit. But he commands them to wait. And it doesn't tell us why they had to wait, but what we do know is that 
our God is an intentional God. And that waiting teaches us a lot of things. You see, waiting requires humility. It requires dependence. It requires a letting go of our plan and our timing. It requires obedience. You ever have to wait for someone? Mm -hmm. Your whole plan is at the mercy of the person you're waiting for. You see, I love my wife, Rachel. Oh, you probably know where this illustration is going, right? You don't need to be a prophet to know where this illustration is going. Okay, I love my wife, Rachel, but you need to pray for her because she has this syndrome. It's called bout to leave syndrome. And I don't know, it kind of flares up. Every time we about to leave the house, something happens to her. She's got to go back in. She's forgotten something. She's got to go to the bathroom. But it only happens when we about to leave that house. And I'm there in the car saying, I'm going to drive away. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to wait. And my pride is speaking to me. I can do this. We can do this alone. But then I realize, for all the husbands out here, it's better to wait for your wife, right? (laughs) Why? Because I think about the rest of the day and I think, I can't do the rest of the day alone. (laughs) There's no way. I don't even, I can't even handle this grocery list. I don't even know. So it's better for me to wait, to be humble and wait on my wife. See, Jesus speaks to any pride, any self-reliance that the disciples may have, and he says, wait for the Holy Spirit. And he teaches them what we need to learn again today. It is better to wait on God than to go alone. And I really believe that someone needs to hear this today as you're entering this next season. You need God. You need him to face what's ahead. See, don't be too prideful to say, I'm just gonna do it on my own. I'm just gonna do whatever I think. Don't be too prideful to go ahead of what God wants for you and the timing that God has for you. See, it's better to go with God in his timing than to go in your own timing without him. See, a life being a disciple of God means we follow Jesus. We don't follow ourselves. We don't follow our emotions. We don't follow our own wisdom. We don't follow our plan. We follow the Lord. And that requires us to obey, to listen, to depend, to ask. You see, before the disciples were to go and do, they were told to wait and depend on God. See, don't enter this new season without praying. Don't enter this new season without asking, without sitting with the Lord. Don't enter this new season without speaking to him and consulting him on on what he wants for your life. The most incredible miracles that I've witnessed in people's lives always, always happen when they go God's way over their own. It always happens when they go God's timing, God's way over their own. Jesus tells the disciples what I'm, and I'm telling you this today, we need the Holy Spirit. We need his power for what's next. You see, the Holy Spirit's power will give you strength that that your strength cannot give you. You know that word power that he promises us in the Greek is dunamis. It's the power through God's ability. It comes from the the English word, the root word, dynamite. And through the Holy Spirit, Jesus says he will give us the explosive power of God's ability. It's a power with no limits. It's a power that can do all things. It's, a, it's, it's the same spirit and, and, and same power that was on Jesus, Acts 10, 37 to 38. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. See, that is the power that we need. It's the power that God gives, and it only comes from the Holy Spirit. 
who is one with God, the third person in the Trinity. And though we cannot see him, let me tell you, there is evidence that he is real. As we experience how he, he guides, reveals, convicts, prompts, gives wisdom, empowers the people of God. See, the Holy Spirit, he gives us this dynamite power. Why? Because we need it for what we're called to do. And I want to be clear with us today as a family. What we're called to do in this world is not to get rich and be comfortable to have all our dreams in life come true, not to have influence or to rise the corporate ladder. That's not the calling of God. See, what we're called to do is greater than that. See, to get rich and do all that stuff, you can do that in your own strength, in your own power. You can do that all on your own, but you do need power for something bigger. You see, God, he's giving us power for something greater than just accomplishing our selfish ambitions. God is giving us power to impact the world, to be Christ's witnesses and advance the kingdom of God. That's why we need the power of God. See, in our key text, the disciples, they ask this interesting question. Look at this, Acts 1, 6 to 8. Then they gathered around him and asked him, this disciple speaking, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So right here, they're asking Jesus, hey, are you gonna establish the kingdom now? You resurrected. Is this now the time? Will the Jews finally be free? Is this the time? Will you rule and reign forever? And this is what Jesus replies to them. He said to them, verse seven, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, look at this. He, they're asking, will you set up the kingdom? And he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. He says, only the Father knows when the eternal millennial kingdom will be established. Only him has the authority and knows the dates or times. Don't be concerned of that. But then he says, but you be concerned about your part. You see that? He says, don't be concerned about what we're gonna do. Be concerned about but what you're gonna do. And he says, but you. And I could imagine the disciples, you know, when someone says, but you, and you say, but, but who, him, me, me? I thought it was you, God. He says, no, no, you have a part to play. You're gonna advance the kingdom of God. You will be my witnesses. You will advance the kingdom around the world. How? With the power of the Holy Spirit. And he echoes on them the great commission in Matthew 28 that says, go into all the world and make disciples. You see, that's what the power is for. That's what the power of the Spirit, why it's given to be effective in our ministry, to, to be able to complete what God has tasked us with to give us the energy, the wisdom, the strength, the perseverance, the boldness, the heart to change this city, change this world, change it for Jesus. That's why he gives us the power. Don't miss the greater purpose of your life going into this next season. Don't miss it. You're called to be a witness, a disciple maker, to love God and to love others and to lead others into loving God. And if you're here today saying, I can't do it, I'm here to tell you, you can by the power of the Holy Spirit resting on you. Join yourself to the mission of Christ and find your best life serving him. And we talk about this from the pulpit a lot. It's not an easy life. Nobody has said it's an easy life. But when you're living out the plan of God for your life, when you're living out literally what the creator has designed for you to walk in, there's nothing more fulfilling in this life than that. And though Jesus is not here physically to help us navigate all of the challenges and trials that we will face, I wanna tell you, the Holy Spirit is with us. God has never left us. John 16, look at this verse, John 16, 7, 11, but very truly I tell you, 
It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Imagine how good the Holy Spirit is that Jesus says, it's better that I go so that he can come and be with you. He's here and we need him. We, we need him for what's next. We need him to be the witnesses of Christ. We don't need more podcasts. We don't need more pep talks. We don't need more money. We don't need more resources. We need the power of God on his people to empower us to go out into all the world. So to all those who are weary, discouraged, all those who feel weak and tired, don't let what you feel rob you of the truth. The wait is over. The advocate is here. You see, what you need for this next season of your life, what you need for your life's assignment, what you need for the call of God over your life, what you need to fulfill the vision of God that he's placed on your life is not coming. It has already arrived in the Holy Spirit. It's a good gift. It's waiting for you to receive it. See, that's the next thing. God gave the Holy Spirit as a gift to be received. In our key text, he says, wait for the gift that will come. Just like Jesus promised, the gift did come. And the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2, 1 to 4, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What a passage. It's a moment in history when the church was birthed, and I love that word that we see there. It says suddenly, suddenly in an instant, God was faithful to his word. Suddenly in an instant, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit came down. In an instant, everything changed. I wanna encourage you, in an instant, everything can change in your life. In a moment, in an instant, when God shows up, it can change your life. And in an instant, the Holy Spirit was no longer a wish, a waited upon person, a hope in the distance. The Holy Spirit was reality. And on that day, wind and fire came from no other place but from heaven above. And it rested on the people of God and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. On that day, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Fulfilling what Jesus told them. Remember in our key passage, what does he say to them? Acts 1.5, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You see, there are different experiences that we can have with the Holy Spirit. When we receive Christ, I want you to understand this. We're born again. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. All of us here who have accepted Christ have the whole Holy Spirit in us. He is edifying us. He is, lives within us. We're born again. John 3 teaches that. But Jesus is talking to the disciples about something else. He's talking to them about a different experience of the Holy Spirit. He says, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's saying baptizo, which means to be completely immersed in the Spirit, clothed and filled by the Spirit of God. What does this mean? Everyone here today has the Holy Spirit, but not everyone has been baptized by the Spirit. Not everyone here has experienced what they have experienced here at Pentecost. And it's difficult to put into words what the baptism of the Spirit's like, what being filled with the Spirit does to the believer. We're gonna try to explain it over the next couple of weeks, but what we know is from that day onward, things were never the same. We look at the life of the apostles, they were never the same. They were empowered with the dynamite power of God. See, today you need to know that what the believers experience in that upper room is what God desires for you to also experience. He said to his disciples, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The same baptism of the Holy Spirit that was given to them 
It's the same baptism that is available to anyone who believes and desires for the Holy Spirit to rest and empower them. Why? Because the wait is over. The Holy Spirit's here. The question you have to ask yourself is, do I want to receive the Holy Spirit? Do I want this gift? Do we want the Holy Spirit to fill us? Do we want our lives to change? Some of us aren't ready for our life to change yet. But do you want to live a life for God? Do you want to change your life? Since it's a gift, it cannot be earned, but it definitely needs to be received. See, when I was praying about this series, there's this huge burden that filled my heart about those who may not have experienced the baptism of the Spirit. You know, I don't know why, maybe you thought it was weird or, or someone didn't teach it to you or, or maybe you thought it was for somebody else, but I'm here to show you the words of Jesus. He says, you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You need to know that God wants more for you, more of his presence, more of his power. God wants you to be clothed and filled and I'm convinced one of the reasons why we're this, the, our church is not as powerful as the early church is we have not fully embraced the full measure, of the dynamite power of God. And I'm praying that Champion Life Center of Brampton would have that desire. We want the Holy Spirit. We want the power of God. We want our lives to change. We want to impact this world. I am ready, God, to be clothed by you. See, that's my prayer for our church. Because you need to know that it's possible for a power to exist and never tap into it. You know, I, I remember I was struggling all day. You know when your phone's on low battery? It's like at the beginning of the day. And I'm struggling all day only to find when I was at home in the evening to open my backpack and there was a power bank right there with me. The power existed. I just didn't tap in. It's the same thing with us as we walk with God. The power could exist, and you can never tap in. And sure, it's not going to affect your salvation, but why not tap in? If God says, if Jesus says it's a gift, a good gift, why not experience it in its full measure? You see, look what it says in Luke eleven nine to 13. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? It's a good gift. Look at, it, look, at this, look at this encounter that Paul has. He finds uh, these believers in Acts 19, two to six, who, who didn't even know the Holy Spirit existed, and that could be you here today. Look what it says, Acts 19, two, and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no. We haven't even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, then, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. What I love about this story is they never knew the power existed. They never tapped in. But then they did. And then suddenly, the Holy Spirit came. In an instant, they didn't have to wait in the upper room. They didn't have to wait a couple days. But in a moment, the Holy Spirit came. Why? Because the wait is over. The Holy Spirit is here. And at any time you desire, you can be clothed. You can be filled. You can be immersed by the Holy Spirit. But do you desire it? Will you receive it? And I'm praying that we do because this is the last thing I want to tell you. The world needs an empowered church. Look at this, the last part of our text in Acts 1, 9 to 11. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid them from their sight. 
They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Look at this passage. After Jesus charges the disciples, he then ascends to heaven. And the angels tell the disciples he's coming back again. And let me tell you today, if you have no hope, have hope, Jesus is coming back again. And he, there will be a day, just like he went up in the sky, he will come down for his church. Be encouraged. See, this passage should encourage us that, the, that, that he will come back again. But let me tell you, it should also prompt us with urgency because there is an end date to our assignment. There is an end date to the Great Commission. There will be a time where there is no longer a chance to decide whether you believe in Jesus, where eternity will come. And I'll tell you, more than ever in this time, the world needs a church that will bring the good news of Jesus. It needs a church that will tell them that Jesus loves them, that he died for them, that he can save them, he can free them, he can heal them, that it's Jesus' love that will fill your aching, broken heart, that it's only him. The world desperately needs Jesus, and it needs a church that will not stop about sharing him. A church that's empowered to endure through persecution that's empowered to bring the truth regardless of whatever happens to us, that will stop, not stop at any cost so that none should perish, but all would receive eternal life in Christ. May that encourage you, if anything else, to receive the power of the Holy Spirit so that you may be an effective, powerful witness to your friends and family so that you can endure through all seasons, sharing the hope of the gospel and not getting discouraged, so that you can be bold and be, have the gifts to be able to share the gospel. Acts 2, this is the last verse I wanna leave you with. It says this, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, I want you to see this first. And it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, the world needs an empowered church who will prophesy, who have the spirit of God on them, who will go out and declare the good news so that everyone would be saved. As I call up the worship team today, you know, the wait's over, church. It's over. It's now up to us to decide. What do we want to do with the gift? What do we desire? Are we ready to walk out this life? Are we ready to be a witness? Because the Holy Spirit's ready. And today, if you don't know Jesus, I want to tell you he loves you. He cares for you. He died for you. He empowers his church to reach you, to find you, so that you could be adopted in the family. He was thinking about you when the Holy Spirit came down. He loves you. I want to tell you, church, be reminded of the words of Jesus that the Holy Spirit is good. You don't need to fear. It's a good gift from the Father. We need his spirit. We need his power. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk more about the power. If you're still curious or you have questions, keep coming. We're going to talk about how that power actually shows up in the lives of the disciples, how it changes them and transforms them. But today, you know what my prayer is? I'm praying that we just have a new desire. That's all I want. That you would sit here at home or here and say, I have a desire, God, to be your witness. I have a desire, Holy Spirit, to invite you in my life. 